Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Breakfast Club. We think maybe it's episode 45. We're not sure. Uh, but we are back with one of our most popular guests, our um, geology collections manager, Chrissy Garcia. Chrissy, thanks for being here again. Hi. Hi. Thanks, everyone. Um, happy election day. If you haven't voted yet, please stop watching this. Go ahead and get that done. We will be here later. It'll be, exist as a static video after the fact. Um, and if you have, then we are so happy you've joined us. We're going to try to take your psyche out of that mode and into the mode of like sparkle and science and beautiful things for your brain and your eyeballs. Um, so Chrissy, what would you, or how do you want to get us started? What are we doing today? Yeah, so I'm going to take you through the geology's mineral collections, and we're going to kind of do a different approach. We're going to look at our collections through a deep time approach. Uh, usually minerals are sort of studied in terms of their uh, crystal structure, chemical composition, which is great and important, and that's here too. But we're going to lean on some of the work of Robert Hazen and his colleagues I'm from the Carnegie Institution of Science and look at our minerals and our collections uh, starting all the way from the Big Bang through to today where modern man is helping minerals to actually evolve and diversify for better or worse. Oh, excellent. Um, so my name is Chrissy Garcia, as Laurel has told you. I manage the geology collections here at the Academy. And so those include fossils, large vertebrate fossils, whales, dinosaur bones, giant bison, some of which you can see behind me here. I don't know if you can see these tusks yeah, vaguely. on the top, mm -hmm. all the way down to teeny tiny micro fossils. But then we also have um, a rich gem and mineral collection, which is worldwide in scope. And we also have a small meteorite collection. So we're gonna get to see some of those last two collections today. All right, excellent. This is very exciting. And as always, I will remind viewers that you're welcome to ask or ask Chrissy questions anytime. Just leave them in the uh, comment section if you're watching on Facebook and in the um, chat box if you're watching on YouTube. We'll feed them in. All right, let's go. Let's do it. All right, so today we're talking about the formation and evolution of minerals, like I said, from the origins of the solar system to man. Here at the Academy, our mission is to explore, explain, and sustain life. And so for us in geology collections, sometimes we feel a little left out because our minerals and meteorites aren't necessarily thought of as, as living because they're not living, but they are important because both living and non-living things are deeply interconnected. So my predecessor, predecessor Jean DeMuth, used to say that if it weren't for rocks, plants and animals would have nowhere to stand, which is true literally and figuratively, but it turns out that bacteria, plants, and animals are also responsible for the formation and evolution of a large proportion of the mineral species we see on Earth today. So the work that we're going to focus on today as sort of our framework for looking at our collections was developed by Robert Hazen. Um, and what he and his colleagues have done has taken a deep time approach to viewing the history of minerals. So his work distinct or identifies 10 distinct, but sometimes overlapping periods of mineral diversification occurring in three eras, beginning with the origin of our planet all the way to the humans. And what this work does is helps us understand the interplay and interconnected of our living and non-living non worlds. So the big bang, start off big. So hydrogen, helium, and lithium appear about a half million years after the big bang. Supernova drive the formation of about a dozen mineral species. But first, what are minerals? Well, a mineral is a compound with a characteristic chemical composition and a crystalline form. It's important to note this because prior to the first mineral or crystal, elements existed in gaseous form. So expanding gaseous envelopes of energetic stars cooled and microcrystalline matter formed. So what were the first crystals to appear? Well, probably microcrystals that were 100% carbon so diamond or graphite. 
and no diamonds weren't flowing, floating around in space in mm. the way that we think of them as dazzling um, cut gems. But I want to go ahead and show you some from our collections right now. And this is special because we don't bring these out often. Ooh, okay, this is exciting. Should I bring up the specimen cam? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. We're gonna try to give you all an extra an extra good view of all the sparkle, which I feel kind of guilty uh, talking about because you immediately launched into so much smart substantive information and I was like, it's gonna be pretty. It will be pretty, I <laughs> promise. <laughs> And again, the smart stuff is not my work. It's uh, Bob Hazen and his colleagues. All right, well, I think you have a seat at the smart table. We're already getting some questions about fluorescent minerals. Ooh, we have and, those. Yeah. All right, so we have some diamonds here. All of these are from South Africa. And here they are. Ooh, I don't know if you can really see that. Oh, maybe down a little bit. Looks like it won't focus too close, but wow. Uh-huh. Can you, I can bring it over to the camera up here. Oh, here, let me change over and do this one. Yeah. Let's see. I'm touching this with my hand. Oh, wow. Teeny tiny. Put that back. And these are research specimens. So they all have labels, they're cataloged, they're a part of our research collections. And um, we've gotten a question that asks why a, or like what, what determines whether a diamond would be part of a research collection versus going to a jeweler, for example? Uh, well, I guess that sort of depends on who's purchasing the diamond, unfortunately, because they right. are such a, an expensive, lucrative, kind of tough to see, but you can see yeah. it's not that perfectly cut. It's dark in color. And Sheila asks how old these diamonds are? I don't know how old these are, but these came from someone's private collection. So this is from the Mendenhall collection. Mm -hmm. um, this is from the Defoe collection. So a large proportion of our mineral collections are acquired through donation. We have a really vibrant mineral community here in the Bay Area, and they've helped to build these collections. So they are the ones who decided that these shouldn't go to a jeweler, they should be in collections, they should be available for study mm -hmm. and for education. And we've gotten a question about whether they're kept on the um, shelves with other specimens or in, do you treat the kind of commercially valuable minerals differently? That's a great question. I'm not going to give you too clear of an answer. On They're purpose? under tight lock and key. Okay, got That's it. That's all I'll tell you. <laughs> okay. We, Fair we do take special special consideration. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to find one of my favorites. There you are. And did you say from Matthew, he's curious about the location of those? Did you mention, did you mention where those were collected? Yeah, most are from South Africa, um, the Cape province. Okay. Here is one of my favorite. Oh, wow, it's beautiful. It's a biggie. It's from the Vonson collection. And Vonson was, um, really important in the Academy's history, especially in building the mineral collections. He was an honorary curator of oh. minerals here for many years. Okay. And he did that work for free as a volunteer. Well, was his uh, profession related to minerals or was that just a, a passion? You know, I can't remember his specific history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Vonson was totally self-taught. So he was an expert, but because he educated himself and he yeah. was extremely knowledgeable 
and to this day is highly revered. Yeah, neat, okay. Well, let me know if you want your slides back or if you're happy. Yeah, let's it. move on. Okay. So this diagram sort of shows uh, the stages of mineral evolution. Hazen breaks this down into 10 stages that occur in three distinct area, eras. So we just looked at era zero and we're going into one and two. Um, but you can kind of see here that there are periods that are relatively flat and then there are big jumps in the number of mineral species. And so we're gonna walk through some of those. The first era began about 4.56 billion years ago during planetary accretion, when approximately 60 minerals are thought to have evolved. So these included iron nickel metals, sulfides, phosphides, silicates, and oxides, like those that you can find in chondrite meteorites. So the image that you see on the left is a chondrite meteorite, and it contains these characteristic chondrules, which are relatively spherical um, silicate-rich particles. Uh, and so these form as droplets that were accreted to the parent asteroid. Achondrites, like the one that you see on the right, are meteorites that don't contain chondrules. They're meteorites that have undergone alteration. So as chondrites clump together due to gravitational forces, they can become large enough to partially melt. They undergo alteration, and then they start to differentiate or separate out into a body with a core and a crust. So Hazen's second stage of mineral evolution is the stage of achondrite formation, which occurred about 4.55 billion years ago. So these processes result in an increase from about 60 mineral species to 250. And some of the mineral species that evolved are the classics that are abundant uh, on earth, like quartz, carbonates, and clay minerals. And Laurel, I've got a couple meteorite examples here. Okay. If we want to pull up the cam. Perfect. I'll make this so this is a chondrite slab. It's been cut and polished. And I apologize, the light's not good there. So I'm gonna try to go to the computer camera. Okay. So those little sparkles you see there, those are the chondrules. Oh, it's really neat. And again, this is a piece that's been cut and polished so that you can see that structure. It's really cool to think about minerals as um, species that have uh, evolved. That's not something that we, those aren't like words we really think of in, in, in terms of non-living things that often. Yeah, I think our planetarium folks think of it in that way. Right. But the rest of us who are biologists or paleobiologists, right. you know, we really are focused on life on this planet this is a palisite. I'm oh. going to bring it to here again. Oh, okay. Let me move I over. Think so. <laughs> so this is an achondrite. If you were here, I might let you pick it up so you could feel how heavy it is. So it's an iron meteorite. But if you can see, there are these gold little pockets, mm -hmm. and those are full of olivine. And then the shiny part that you see, that's your metal, your iron. Wow, and it's beautiful. It's uncanny how heavy it is. And this is from uh, the Atacame in Chile. My, Michaela oh. would like to know whether we have uh, Moldavite in the collection. What is it? Moldavite, M-O-L-D-A-V-I-T-E. I'm not sure. I have a cheat sheet here though. <laughs> okay. I should tell you all, I'm not an expert in minerals. I have a background in geology, so I've taken all the classic courses, but I'm not a mineral expert. I don't know. It's working for it's working for us so far. Well, I enjoy checking these things out with you all. 
I don't think we have any Moldavite. Yeah, yeah we'll I, look into that. Okay. Michael, feel free to tell us what uh, that is and why you ask. Yeah, educate us. And then Sheila just asked, can chondrites be easily found on the ground if one knows how to spot them? Um, <laughs> meteorites are a tricky one. People find them, it happens. Mm -hmm. But usually what people find are not meteorites. Uh, and to be, to be made official, whatever you do find, it actually has to be like tested and approved. Mm -hmm. So Arizona State has some really good resources on their website. So I, I would check that out and okay. take a look at that. Okay, sounds good. Okay, what can I, can I serve you any sort of window at this point? Yeah, let's move on to the next stage. So the next stage starts the new era. This is the second era of mineral evolution and it happens in three stages. The first stage or stage three is the stage of planetary differentiation into the major layers that you see here. So earth is unique in that it ha has water and we had water during this stage, which allowed for interactions between magma and early oceans and atmospheres, which drove diversification of mineral species. The hydrous minerals were able to form and zircons are one of those minerals. Uh, zircons are extremely durable and can survive really rigorous rock cycling. So all of that uh, plate tectonics, subduction, mountain building, they can survive those processes. And scientists have found zircons that date back to 4.4 billion years old in Western Australia. And I'm gonna go ahead and show you some zircons. And I think I'm going to come up here. That's great. They're super hardy. They're not necessarily sparkly and pretty like some of our minerals, but they've got this fantastic structure. And they're just super interesting. Yeah, that's amazing. How did you say how old those were, or do we know? I don't know how old these are, mm -hmm. but it'd be something to to kind of explore in our own collections. Mm -hmm. Like, do we want to try and date all these things based on where they're found? We could start to do that. This is a little piece of rock that some zircons are in. I don't know if you can oh, see we can that. Oh, see it. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's really neat. It's, it's relatively novel to be thinking about mineral collections in this way or just minerals in this way in general. So if we were to do that and try and date these things, um, it'd be a great exercise, but it'd probably take a lot of effort. Yeah. Well, maybe we can rouse some volunteers here. Yeah. Yeah, maybe that could be a fun virtual citizen science project. Yeah, I like it. Slides again? Yeah, let's do slides, okay. please. All right. The fourth stage of era two. Probably one of my favorites. So this is the stage of granite terrains. And we get these fantastic pegmatite veins. So the picture on the left is green bushes pegmatite um, in Western Australia. There's a lot of Western Australia stuff, folks. It's, it's one of the oldest land masses that's relatively unaltered. But you can also hear in this picture, um, a case from our Gems and Minerals Unearthed Gallery. And what you see are some raw specimens, but also the finished commercial products like cut gems. And these types of minerals are what we find in pegmatite veins. So this stage is a result from continual reworking of the crust and mantle due to plate tectonics and repeated cycles of heating and cooling that allow for the formation of granite terrains that contain these pegmatites. 
And these pegmatite veins occur during the final stages of granite crystallization, so the final cooling stages. And during this stage, uh, often what happens is that rare elements can concentrate. So these are elements like boron, lithium, tin, uranium, and others. And so this cooling process leads to the formation of new minerals, uh, some of which are best known for their gem quality. And California has lots of these, especially Southern California, which is really well known for its tourmalines. And I have some beautiful ones here for us to look at. Excellent. Oop, okay. Okay. This is a tourmaline from San Diego can County. Oh, wow. You can see this. Yeah. And you might be able to see the color zonation. Mm -hmm. So it goes from a purple to a green color. And I'm going to come to the computer again. Let's see these a little bit. Wow, better. that's really extraordinary. So the light in our collections rooms is low because that helps preserve specimens, but it makes it hard for me to show them to you in this way. So I apologize. No, that was a pretty good view. Find another one. And if you're just joining us, a reminder that you are welcome to ask questions. Please. Please in the chat box or in the comments. Wow. This is another one. It's huge. Also from San Diego of Canon. Wow. I'm going to come up to the Mary. It's hard to stop saying, wow. <laughs> Here's my head. Here's this crystal. <laughs> wow, that's really remarkable. Yeah. Wow. And if you're in the area, I invite you to come and see the minerals that we have on display, which are some of our most spectacular pieces. Mm -hmm. And you can see those in the Gem and Mineral Gallery, gallery um, called Gems and Minerals Unearthed. Mm -hmm. But we also have a special behind the scenes tour that takes you into the gem vault. And that's something really cool. It's a special treat, something cool to do if, you, if yeah. you're here. Yeah. And we are happily again open for ticket reservations at mm -hmm. very low capacity, but. And what's next? I'm gonna show you a couple more because these really are some of my favorites. Oh my gosh. This is a barrel from Brazil, from a very famous region, Minas Gerais. Wow. And back to the camera here. You can see that. That's amazing. And Susan asked um, what causes uh, minerals to form a column like that versus say um, some of the more the other squatter geometric shapes you showed earlier? Yeah, that's a great question. And it has to do with what elements make up the mineral. So their chemical composition and how those different elements come together to form a crystal structure. So it's, it's all chemistry. And what is the small? Oh, I'm sorry. You're switching now. Oh, oh great. go ahead. No, I thought it was going away, and I was, I was like, wanted to see the um, pink one. Did you show us the other one already? Yeah, sure this is a green barrel. This is another from San Diego, also from the Vonson collection. Wow. These are just so amazing. They really are. But back to the crystals and how they form. Mm -hmm. The larger crystals are a result of slower cooling. So the quicker you cool, the smaller your crystal size, which is why things okay. that are extruded out of volcanoes are like micro crystalline because they're cooling so quickly. But things that are trapped in rock that are being heated and cooled and heated and cooled 
and cooling slowly over time, they can form these huge crystals. And you see those in caves in Brazil and Mexico and Southern California, we have some too, like we said. Right, yeah, that was a good question. So Stephanie asks if you have a favorite crystal finding location in the uh, Bay Area. I personally don't. I think, well, I'll show you this in a minute, but I'll go ahead and jump ahead a little bit. But I think that I would like to check out a place in San Benito County way back when, before it was mined out, that contained Benitoite, which is our state gem. And I'll show you a piece now. Okay. So we'll come back to it because we're not quite there in our mineral evolution stages yet. Okay, fair. But this is a piece of serpentinite rock with bonitoite crystals. Wow. I didn't know we had a state gem. Yeah, I'm gonna come to the computer camera just to kind of... Wow. It's a little difficult to see here, but they're this really pretty deep blue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can see it. They're getting washed out a little by the yellow light, but it's still very much there. So like I said, this vein has been mined out, um, but San Benito County is kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, Steven, we see your message and we will uh, we'll let Chrissy know. Somebody have a comment? Yeah, we're, um, so Stephen has a, he basically is has some photos that he would like to send you. So is asking Ooh. for an email address, but maybe a broader, a good broad question is if people have things they wanna show you in case you're interested in them or requiring them for collections, what's the best way to do that? Email me. Okay. And are you comfortable yeah. sharing that? Sharing that? Sure. Okay. Yeah, you can share that, Laurel. Okay, why don't no you let me, or I'll just put that in there now, I know what it is. I was gonna ask you to tell it to me, but okay. All right. Even we'll add that for you now. So and since we just looked Benito White, we can just mm -hmm. go ahead and jump forward okay. to stage five. All right, do you have my slides? I do, they're up. I see them now, great. So this last stage of era two, is the era of crust and mental reworking. And this is caused by tectonic movements at subduction zones where water and rocks interact under high pressure and low temperatures. So serpentinite, our state rock, is an example of an outcome of this process. And I just showed you some bonitoite, which we find in serpentinite. And so this is all uh, because of this process, which begins here in stage five. So at the end of this stage, we now have roughly 1500 mineral species. And some of these mineral species are things uh, that give us serpentinite, jadeite, and also sulfur deposits or sulfide deposits. And so the classic pyrite, which I have to show you this piece that I was showing Laurel early, earlier, because it's just so cool. Pyrite forms these perfect cubes. Amazing. Often also known as fool's gold. <laughs> it's just amazing. And I'm gonna come over to the computer. Wow, yeah, it's just unreal really is. And where did you, where was that collected, did you say? This one is from Spain. Okay. Do you know how um, states choose their kind of state gem? Is it sort of like, does it have anything to do with just how predominant it is in the area? Or I guess it could also be important to their history, that kind of thing, but there's yeah. no like, Sciencey criteria are there? Their history, their economy. Um, so our state mineral is gold, 
<laughs> our state rock is serpentinite or serpentine. Mm -hmm. Our state gem is bonitoite. So they're they're unique to us for one reason or another. Yeah. And I think other states follow suit. Yeah, it makes sense. It's a good power trio. <laughs> it, it is. Yeah. Uh, slides again? Yeah, let's do okay. it. There you go. So let's get to it. How did minerals really evolve? I love this little cartoon here. So we're going to start moving into the era of life, where bi biology becomes the energy of mineral diversification. So in stage six, we have biologically precipitated minerals. And this era begins in the Paleoarchaean about 3.8 billion years ago, when large scale surface mineral deposits, including carbonates and banded iron formations were precipitated due to changing atmospheric and ocean chemistries. And you can see some examples of this here. So sorry, I'm having a tough, tough time talking today. Mm -hmm. But over time, photosynthet photosynthetic microorganisms, like the ones that created stromatolites here and banded iron, um, dramatically increased the oxygen in Earth's atmosphere, leading to what is known as the great oxidation event. And things start to get really interesting after this point. So this is another shot from our Gems and Minerals Unearth Gallery. And on the left-hand side, you can see a case called Minerals and Biology. And we're working up to that stage right now. So the next stage is stage seven. And during this stage, 60% of my minerals diversify. And this is caused by oxidation of the 1500 or so minerals that existed before the great oxidation. And we get beautiful specimens that we know really well, like malachite, azurite, and turquoise. And I'm gonna show you some of those now from our collections. This is great. I, yeah, I love this, Christy. It's re it really is um, such an amazing way to think about these things we traditionally just think of as static, unchanging, always been there, you know, whatever. But no, they have this whole life history, which is really amazing. Yeah, and apparently the whole idea behind looking at minerals this way came from a conversation at a Christmas party <laughs> where someone was asked like, well, hey, were clay minerals always on earth or when did they first show up? Because those minerals are critical to life as we know it. Right. This here is a piece of malachite. Wow. And I chose this because of the deep green color, but it's so rich that it's almost hard to see in this format. We can see it though. Yeah, that's really oh, great. Amazing. Yeah. And then this is one of my favorite pieces that was donated last year by one of our fantastic donors, Bob Byers. Wow. It's like screaming blue. And this is azurite from Mexico. Azurite. Well, this is amazing. I keep I keep saying wow and amazing and extra. I don't know why people like can deal with me as a host, but because I always I'm just amazed by everything and make weird noises. But I think this is this is like really, really um taking that to new levels. That's extraordinary. Awesome. So the next stage is a little boring. It's actually referred to as the boring billion. The boring so what? Boring billion. Oh. It's about a billion years where not much really happens. Um, then we move into the next stage, which is the stage of snowball earth. So earth went through at least two major glaciations during this time and widespread carbonate caps were laid down, aragonite fans, uh, come out of this era and I'm going to show you some pieces of aragonite right now. Okay, I'll make you go large. So this is a piece of layered aragonite. It's from California, from Inyo. And does that look on your end, does that look as um, just like solidly white or consistently white as it does yes. on screen? Okay, wow. Yep. Wow. 
Oh, Rachel just told me another? that I am just voicing everyone else's amazement by making all these annoying sounds. So that's a reassuring. Thank you very much, Rachel. This is one of my favorites. It reminds me of fungi. It really does. But it's aragonite from Mexico. And does that grow? Um, would that be have been positioned in the way that you were holding it? Like, would it? Does it grow? Did it grow up like that? It could have. It could have grown up, which would have made it a stalactite. Mm -hmm. No, stalagmite. I'm um, I mean, <laughs> down. It was a yeah. stalactite. Okay, I'm just glad that you also have that problem because I tight might. Yeah. Very, very cool. Now what? But then back to the slide where okay. we actually see this final stage, which is the stage 10, which is when we're still life on the life on earth stage. Did you, did, did yep. you know that? Is that the right? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yep, where we're seeing all the shells. Yep, perfect. Yeah, so this is the final stage technically of the third era. And what you're seeing is life evolve all of these, these new mechanisms, this biomineralization. So we get exoskeletons made of calcite, shells, um, all the way to teeth and bones, which you see some of behind me. And then I'm gonna try to pull out a drawer here, drawer from the IZ collection. Can you see? Yes. Can you see this huge shell? Oh, it's a little low for the camera. Let me reposition the camera. We saw like a very tantalizing top. Oh yeah, per this will be perfect. Oh my God. So this is enormous. Oh wow, that's incredible. I've never but seen these. Much. Yeah. <laughs> these are the kinds of innovations that start happening. And it, changes the mineral chemistry and life on this planet as we know it forever. And then the final, final stage is the stage of the Anthropocene. Okay. It's a bit debated whether or not that's an actual stage um, formally recognized by geologists, hmm. but here we are today and humans are actually changing the mineral species that exist on the planet. And we might be the most significant driver since the great oxidation event. And so basically our actions in mining, um, even, even how we burn things. So there were minerals discovered at an ancient sacrificial burial site in Austria. So all these kinds of activities wow. are driving the evolution of new minerals. So it's, it's really kind of fascinating. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. you know, still much remains to be seen. Yeah. Yeah. This is, I mean, this is amazing. I really, you really have in one stream and I've known you for years, but, but in one stream, yeah, I feel like this really has changed the way I think about minerals as changing, growing, evolving, like, yeah. And of course, and of course all the human activity is changing those along with everything else. I mean, that's an extraordinary amount of, new input and I don't know, this is great. I, I now think of these things as alive that I didn't before and, and that's pretty magical. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. go check out Bob Hazen's work. He's got a Nova special. There's pop sci articles from like Scientific American. There's so much good info out there. He explains it so much better than I do. I'm just glad I got to show you uh, some of our minerals in our collections today through his lens. Yeah, this is amazing. Um, we had one question about whether the minerals are treated differently than other geology specimens. And I think that is, I think it's a different question than we talked before about storing yeah. some of the others, but yeah. Yes, so things in our collection are treated differently based on what their needs are. And that really has to do with what they're made up of. So some fossils have to be treated differently than others and some minerals have to be treated differently than others. One great example is opal. Opal is hydrous, it contains water in its structure. And so we don't want it to be in dry conditions. Um, whereas most of our other specimens, we do want relatively dry conditions because moisture tends to help the... Oh, okay, we may have temporarily lost Chrissy. Let's see if she'll pop back again. 
Mm. Well, we're going to give her a second. So viewers, you, um, this is a great time. I think Chrissy has kind of wrapped up the planned specimens um, in terms of what she's shown. So this is a great time to get in other questions if you have them. We'll see if Chrissy pops back in. Um, and if she doesn't, I can make up um, fake answers that uh, will ultimately get me um, fired, but could make for a good rest of the live stream. We'll see. Um, and I'm gonna see who else has left comments here that we didn't cover. So hello to Blake. And we had questions earlier about fluorescent minerals um, because we mentioned those briefly in response to another comment. So we can ask Chrissy about those if she comes back. Um, lots more questions about diamonds. Okay, Chrissy has now left. And so this is a good sign that she may re-enter soon. So I'm just gonna kind of keep making noises to see if we can get her back. And by make noises, I mean fill space to give her a little more time. Um, Aaron, I would also love to see how we store opals. That's not something I've ever seen before. So when she comes back, we'll ask her to at least describe that. Maybe we can get it into a later live stream with Chrissy. Um, thank you, Tamara. I really appreciate that. Tamara has just offered me some job security in case I do start just making things up at some point. Um, hello to Grace. Thanks for being here. And any questions, you all? I can see. I can see you all out there. I can see how many of you are out there, and would love to have some good ones for Chrissy when she tries to come back. Which I don't know. Let's give her. Let's see how long we can give her. Let's give her three more minutes. I think I can kind of hold the stage for three minutes, maybe with your help. Um, if we have a fossil, can we donate it to the Academy? So I think they would love to, I mean, the answer is yes, if it's something that um, will be valuable from a science perspective. Um, and the way to figure out whether what you have will be valuable um, to scientists is to send Chrissy an email. So we put that in the comments earlier, but it is C Garcia. Uh, at calacademy.org. So C-G-A-R-C-I-A at calacademy.org. And I would say just put in um, the best image that you have and highest resolution image that you have and include any information you know about where it was collected and when it was collected, if you have that. Are there any minerals from Tamara? Are there any minerals that the curators really want to add to their collections? Which list? I bet there are. Um, that's a great question that we can save. Uh, for Chrissy, um, but we heard about Moldavar earlier, which sounds kind of beautiful and we didn't have in stock. So I'm sure there's other things like that. I think the collections that we have, whether they are um, from the geology collection or any of our other scientific collections are um, often largely informed by um, either collections that started locally, like things that we, so we have strengths in California specific species, for example, or that were accessioned later. And so it's kind of a range that for sure does leave holes. Mm. Running out of steam here. Are there, this is from Jack, are there books that expand on the evolution of mineralogy and rocks? Yeah, I'll bet that we have some really good recommendations for you. That's a great question as well. Michaela, yeah, I love your earlier description of the green glass. I'm definitely Googling that later. And I don't know, folks, we might have to give up on Chrissy. I really don't want to because all of your questions are so good. Grace, what is the oldest fossil ever found? Yeah, fantastic. I also want to know. Mm, let's see. Checking text messages <laughs> just to see. <laughs> okay, so Chrissy has apparently entirely lost internet inside the academy, which is not unheard of. It is a um, largely cement building built to protect with very thick walls, um, many specimens. So I suppose that we will go ahead and wrap this up. Um, Sheila, are diamonds really a girl's best friend? I, I mean, I think that's probably so much about perspective, but also probably no one would mind having them as long as they were ethically sourced. Uh, so yes, we will go ahead and wrap up. Um, but Chrissy is uh, always, I think she's always one, like excited to come back and show us more. So one thing you could do is leave more comments about things that you would like to see and that'll help her build her next list. Um, so we'll get her back again to finish this up. 
And thank you all so, so much for being here. Um, and as a reminder, in, if you're in the Bay Area, we are um, now open to the public again at very limited capacity. So that reservation system is on is up and running for tickets and we'd love to see you if you feel comfortable doing that. Um, but mainly, thank you all so much for tuning in and for being here. And we will be continuing these programs even though we are reopened, so um, have reopened. So if you have ideas for particular curators or scientists you'd like to hear from, please let me know that as well. And again, thank you so much and take care. Have a wonderful rest of the week um, and we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.